All right, so chapter 50, terrorism response. All right. Um, mostly what we're going to look at here is how larger disasters and larger mass casualty incidents may include uh, circumstances where it was intentional to cause as much harm as possible and what those changes or unique aspects of that situation and how are they going to affect our care and our approach to the scene in a lot of ways though we are still going to approach it like it was a hazardous materials exposure and or a crime scene and so a lot of as well as the mass casualties so there's a lot of different things that'll go into it <clears throat> all right um terrorism feels like so 2000s so um we're just not gonna like get too sh hung up on it but there's a lot of different forms of it out there and as a result there's a lot of different types of injuries and problems that you would um encounter so international of course when something a group is coming from another nation into your nation or specifically striking into another nation oftentimes when dealing with these events or events like this there are expectations on the part of the perpetrator that there will be a first response there will be EMS and fire and law enforcement responders and so they will they may plan on secondary devices that are targeting just the uh, the responders so you have to keep your eye out for that and be aware of that possibility it, even when things have been said oh the scene is clear the scene is safe we can come on in there may be still unusual or um things that hadn't been noticed an example was that was the boston marathon there were other devices found on scene that thankfully did not go off that were intentionally that were either intended to have gone off in the first place or were expected to have gone off um during the response so things like that can happen um it's probably one of the most um notable examples of domestic terrorism where factions or groups within the nation are upset with things that are happening in the nation and um terrorism uh well and as a result they uh commit acts of violence against their fellow citizens or their own government um not um not really interested in getting into our individual opinions on some of these incidences and or yeah we're uh never mind all right state terrorist or state sponsored terrorism this is where an or government organization is promoting the use of violence or enabling small groups of people in another nation to commit acts of violence against the civ civilians or the government of that nation in an effort to destabilize the nation um <coughs> sorry excuse me H had a cough there <coughs> um an example of this could have been you we could look at the um birmingham abortion clinic attacks and bombings and such where an individual was convinced that their their religion or their interpretation of relig of their religion insisted on them meeting out a form of justice against people who worked at those locations um so that, and now this is placing you know this pushes puts that what i just said like anti-abortion kind of and that's putting it as issue oriented is that religious is it uh issue that you know it might be both it may cross those lines um we don't 
we don't actually hear a whole lot about eco-terrorism as far as uh, the major events, although they have created some really significant uh, issues overall. Most of the time, they are not causing a lot of um, injury to humans or per uh, persons, and so we don't see or hear as much about it on the news or something like that. At least they balanced it by showing both wings. Although I kind of feel like uh, the limiting government kind of maybe doesn't. Yeah. No, nope. nope. got to move on. Sorry. Um. <laughs> yeah, but it seems like nowadays we're just calling it under a different name we're no longer using that terrorist or whatever you know we, we we've relabeled it oh yeah oh i don't disagree with that that's true you, you know you got me on that one um all right so then you have the folks who are just straight up socio or psychopaths and they are causing havoc for no reason other than they want to cause havoc um one of the examples, a, a, a more notable example of that might be cyber terrorism, where they're hackers. They're not trying to promote a certain cause. They're not uh, there for any particular reason. Heck, they're not even there trying to get ransom money. They are just straight up causing problems because they can and because they want to. Um, um, I would definitely agree with this statement that most attacks are actually carried out by actors. I mean, sorry, um, never mind. All right, so. Yep, I sure am. And I'm, um, my field is getting rather fallow. Let's just put it that way. All right, how do we recognize the potential of a terrorist event? Um, or at least recognize that an event could potentially be a terrorist event because we won't necessarily know that walking in. And while it doesn't change the fact that we are going to treat the patients who are injured and the folks that have been involved, it may very well change how we enter the scene or what other conditions that we might uh, look for or expect. And so look for target, a high value targets kind of a scenario. Where, where might there be a large crowd? Where will, will the location or um, where does the location create a symbol of some sort or represent something? Or what might um, simply create the most amount of fear? Um, or create an emotional reaction like at a school or a church or something like that so um there you go same stuff one of the things i will want i do want to point out for your own scene safety is a common concern associated with terrorist attacks is for the perpetrators to utilize emergency vehicles and uh, disguised as emergency workers to infiltrate the uh, response and cause additional problems. So if you believe or if you see reason to suggest that you are um, entering a terrorist attack or you know responding to a terrorist attack make certain that you have your department issued id very available and very clear um and watch closely for other people to have the same thing do not um fortunately a lot of times we work in areas where we recognize everyone but we but we might not and so when you start seeing like a department showing up and you're like why are they here like they don't we, we don't know them you know pay closer attention to that make certain that they're legit and that they're supposed to be there not going to worry too much about the level of events and such like that um pre-incident indicators those are going to be like oh it's 
they're having the national football championship here today. You know, it's a big event or, you know, and it's a stadium. Uh, and now there's a whole bunch of people who are having respiratory distress or, you know, so something along those lines. Um, those are what's going to start cluing you in that this might be a, um, a terrorist event or an intentional event of some sort. Um, yeah, I think that pretty much goes without saying. Generally speaking, you're not going to be the first one recognizing this potential. But if you do just, hey, Chief, do you all realize we've got like 10 people now with the same symptoms coming out of the same location? Like, we should probably look into this. And why? Because if you have had 10 people with the same symptoms coming out of the same stadium, how many more people are in that stadium? And what is your expectation that there will be even more patients? And so you would want to be like, this could be a problem. So let's keep, let's notify the local hospitals and let's anticipate that there's going to be more victims. Just like the hazmat scene, uphill, upwind. Why? Because most of these events are going to utilize some form of chemical hazard. Now, um, here's, a, here's an example of showing you how to park. That's wonderful. Great. We've kind of already covered this several other places, so we're moving on. Again, we're dealing with hazardous materials. Don't run blindly into this. Do not get that tunnel vision and just focus on the fact, oh, there's a patient, I need to go get them. What symptoms is that patient presenting with or were you reported and make certain you're not exposing yourself to some form of a uh, chemical or biologic or you know, hazard of some sort. So just like we did, so moving on, moving on, you know, contamination or, you know, primary uh, contamination versus secondary contamination. Um, same thing. It's just like in hazmat. That's why I'm moving through this pretty quick. Incident command. We talked about incident command on a major event, mass casualty. You're probably going to have an EMS command or a medical command with uh, underneath I the ICS and you would be a sector or excuse me, a group under the operations sector. And then what are some of your group, uh, what are your, um, you'll have the operations branch and then you'll have the medical sector of the operations branch, but what are some of the groups that will happen underneath the medical uh, branch? We talked about those in ICS. What are some of the things that you might um, have to, if you become the medical branch, the leader of the medical branch, what are some of the things you are going to need to set up underneath of you? Triage? Staging? Yep. For your equipment, there may need to be staging. So triage, staging, transportation, and treatment. You'll need a treatment area. And so we went through all of that. So, all right. And now if this has got hazardous materials, you'll probably need a decontamination section as well. Uh, so triage may identify the patients and then decon, send them to decon, then decon will send them to the tri treatment, or there might be another triaging after decontamination, so on and so forth. And then rehab. If it's a large event, you might need rehab. Hopefully there'll be a lot of police officers there. Um, if the police officers are saying, look, we need you to stay in this area not go over there. We need you to show us your ID or something. Understand they're probably just as freaked out, overwhelmed and uninformed as you are. And they're trying their best to make sure no uh, jerk wad shows up trying, dressed in your uniform. And so that's why they wanna see your ID and such like that. So comply, be cooperative and uh, you know, give them a break. Remember, you know, if God had blessed them, they would have been on your, you know, wearing a paramedic uniform, right? Uh, 
All right. So I already kind of mentioned secondary devices or events, you know, the risk of that. So WMDs are kind of this like nebulous term when it comes to terroristic events or mass events like this, uh, mostly because of um, how ambiguous that means. It's like, what, you know, how much, what, what is, what determines mass destruction? Um, and then also what's the likelihood of a group being able to get a hold of something like that? So here's your categories. Uh, we've kind of already looked at the chemical a little bit. We talked a little about radiologic in the last section. So we'll see some of these here. All right, chemical liquid powder vapor, just like with hazmats. Basically, this is taking a hazardous material, a chemical of some sort, and weaponizing it in some way, trying to intentionally release it, so creating a man, a, an intentional hazardous materials spill. All right, so vesicants, blister agents, this could be um, your chlorine and phosgene. Then you get your respiratory, your choking agents, like... Um, your mustard gas, no, excuse me, mustard is the vesicant. Chlorine is the choking agent. Uh, ammonium, ammonia is a uh, choking agent, such like that. Nerve agents, that'll be your anophosphates. Um, and then so on and so forth. We'll show you some more here in a minute. All right, vapor versus liquid. So here's some of our blister agents, mustard, lewisite, and phosgene. These are things that will cause irritation to the skin. But the real concern, while yes, they're gonna cause issues to your eyes and your skin and nose and such, the real worry is that they're gonna get into your lungs and cause irritation there as well. Um, phosgene is supposed to smell like fresh cut grass, if I remember correctly. Um, so that's a very distinct um, odor. I have not heard of these being used in any wide form, in you know, widespread form or mass release since World War One. Now I know that there are circumstances where they have, but I'm trying to I'm not remembering any major events, but even in combat, even in wars, these have not been significantly used since World War One because of the Geneva Convention and the idea that the chemical warfare should not be used. Um, but those ex chemicals still exist and they're still a concern. So here's some of your irritation symptoms, you know, skin, lungs, uh, eyes, such like that. The real concern here again is your airway. We're trying to isolate that airway, keep, keep them oxygenated. We may need to do early intubation because of the swelling um, and such like that. Decontamination of their eyes and skin is a very important fo focus as well. But these are these vesicants, blister agents, and asphyxiant agents, uh, irritants. They are going to off gas. They're going to contaminate you. So decon prior to treating them is very important. There's the skin rash from a uh, mustard gas exposure. So vesicants, rinse them off, decon them as much as possible, maintain airway control, um, but there's not a lot of um, uh, antidotes that you're going to be able to give the patients for these. Good luck finding uh, BAL, British Anti-Lewisite, which is the um, Lewisite uh, antidote, but m mustard and CX, uh, which is phosgene, you're not going to find a um, antidote. All right, so pulmonary agents, these are going to be very much respiratory. They're not going to have that liquid form um, and could um, be released in a number of different ways. Fortunately, most of the time, these are easily protected against with a SCBA. They're not going to cause as much irritation to your skin. So just simply having that air purifying respirator or self-contained breathing apparatus is ne what's necessary to protect you. All right. So chlorine smells like bleach because bleach has chlorine in it. Bleach chlorine, they're very... Uh, chlorine is a major ingredient in bleach. 
pool chlorine. It smells like it smells like the pool, right? So chlorine, when used for in bleach and in, in pool and such, pool chemicals and such, is in a liquid or solid form that has been bound with other chemicals to stabilize it. When bleach is exposed to acids of some sort, whether you're talking uric acid in urine or some kind of sulfuric acid or um, muriatic acid. These are acid, muriatic acid is used a lot with um, also known as hydrochloric acid, HCl. It's very common pool chemical. If you mix the chlorine and the hydrochloric acid, it actually destabilizes the bleach or the chlorine releasing the chlorine gas and now you have pure chlorine gas which is a choking agent a pulmonary asphyxiant and is extremely irritating to your lungs and it has that green hazy looking fo uh, smoke coming from it and that's the gas releasing um can cause the inflammation strider. And what are we going to do for that? Well, our focus is pro uh, first removing them from the environment, deconning them, making sure that it's not clinging to their body. And so we're off gassing and we're going to get um, choked out by it. But oxygen and airway control. So early intubation, pull, um, break bronchodilators and things like that. And you're also going to need PEEP you know positive end expiratory pressure to keep the keep the air moving in there um phosgene um also it was under the blister agents now it's also listed under choking agents because it has both symptoms it is a very low solubility chemical so it's going to take a lot longer before you see it um, affecting the body and it's going to get way down into the lungs before it starts causing the issues So as you also can see, it can be it can be used, released from a chemical reaction of combustion, right? So like organo, not organo, hydrocarbons like oil, plastics, rubbers, things like that could burn and release phosgene. So this could be present at, with a person who just came out of a house fire or a vehicle fire or something. All right. Now, we already talked about nerve agents. I talked about organophosphate, uh, diazinon, malathion, um, seven dust, paraquat. These are all names of bug killers. These are used in agricultural environments. Grandma might have it in her potting shed for her gardening. Um, you might find it at a hardware store or you'll find it at an ag center, farming supply store or on a large uh, industrial farm or something like that. When exposed, you're going to have your sludgeum symptoms. Atropine and 2-PAM chloride are your treatment after decon. This is not the same as 2,4-D or Roundup or herbicide or weed killer, all right? Weed killers, things that are used to kill plants are very different. They, they're, they're not going to have the same problems. Nerve agents fit in the same class. They block cholinesterase's function. So here's some of them. Taubin, uh, salmon, and sarin. Sarin's probably the most l common one that you'll see or, or hear of um, because it's fairly... Um, there, there was a lot of it made and it still you know exists in a lot of your... Um, Soviet bloc countries and Middle East and such like that. VX nerve gas is the same kind of thing. It's just a heck of a lot more concentrated than some of the others. It's like comparing uh, fentanyl to morphine kind of a, or fentanyl to um, codeine or something like that. So there's your sludgeum um, acronym, just like your dumbbells acronym that we saw a minute ago. So we got the duodote kits, uh, auto injectors, 2-PAM chloride, and such like that. All right. Uh, Taubin, as you can see, it's easy, but I haven't heard of a Taubin release um, anytime recently, although sarin was what supposedly was released in Syria back in, God, what was that, 2015, I think? 2016? During the Syrian Civil War and the onset of um, the ISIS 
scenario, uh, situation. So, all right, we already covered this. Um, hydrogen cyanide, same, we already mentioned that earlier, so no need to get into that again. Um, cyanide is a very deadly uh, chemical and it's easily produced during uh, incomplete combustion in car fires and house fires. This is why if you're on scene with these and you see people trying to f work the uh, fire without proper respiratory protection, they're, they're morons, and you should say something to your uh, to the incident commander, you should point that out, that it is a very unsafe practice. Because even though it's a car fire and they're like, oh, I'm out in open air, they could still inhale some cyanide and they, and they die that night in their sleep and not even realize they were exposed. Because the lower the dose, the longer it takes for it to kill you. And you may not realize you're dying from it. You may not realize you have symptoms. So, yeah, we already talked about all that. So there's there's your uh, categories, your vesicants, your pulmonary, your nerve, and uh, your cyanide agents um, and all of the different uh, concerns specific to them. I would know... I would be familiar with this chart. This is this is a very, very useful chart uh, for this chapter and for this section. All right, so moving from chemical, which is what, very similar to what we saw in hazmat, we're moving into biologic. Now, biologics can also be included in the hazmat category, hazardous materials, but they're not always, they're not often transported in the same quantities or frequency that chemical agents or chemical substances are transported in. All right, so here we can see three major categories, viral, bacterial, and neurotoxins. Neurotoxins are essentially what they are, they're toxins that attack the nervous system, and they're almost always produced by some form of organism. Um, so how is a biologic agent spread? Well, you have to have the vector or some form of uh, dissemination method, whether that's contaminating food or giving it to a person, and then that person spreading it and through another person until the whole city is shut down, and then the whole country is shut down, and then the whole world. Oh, wait a minute, that's what happened two years ago. So, yep, I think we're good on incubation, communicability. We've seen a lot of that recently. I think we know the difference, what a virus is. Remember, it requires a living organism. It requires a host for replication. It will just be destroyed in, it, in open air. Now, some viruses can exist for a while in the open air, but very few viruses can um, resist or exist for very long before they start um, degrading and being broken down simply from UV or other um, chemicals in the environment. This is smallpox. We don't see smallpox anymore, um, but it there are supposedly um, samples of it still stored in um, bio labs. Uh, I think one of them was in Ukraine, but you know, what we do see is chicken pox. Chicken pox looks a lot like smallpox. It just has a difference of presentation as far as starting on the trunk versus starting on the face kind of a thing. Um, Monkeypox, which is associated with uh, smallpox, one of the reasons we were able to get rid of smallpox is it can only be carried by human beings. Right? There are no known animals that have carried or can carry the smallpox virus. So. Once they inoculated all humans and had basically isolated it and stopped its spread, it was eradicated because it couldn't be carried by animals. Whereas monkeypox, cowpox, chickenpox, they can all be carried by animals. And fortunately, they're not. Uh, most of those are not as uh, concerning or de deadly as smallpox. Monkeypox is still pretty concerning. Anyway, those can be carried by animals, so they're real, they're basically impossible to eradicate. Uh, similarly, like human coronaviruses, they can be carried by animals even though they don't infect the animal or the animal doesn't show symptoms of it, they can be carried and spread back to humans. All right, so um, 
Moving on. All right, so viral hemorrhagic fevers. We heard a lot about these back in 2014. Um, Ebola coming out of um, West Africa and the West African countries. Um, there was this big concern that it was going to spread all over the world and you know they were going to bring it to the United States and all that kind of stuff. And we had all these classes on how to um, prevent biological transfer and use PPE and decon our ambulances, and, which were all really good ex exercises. It was really good training and re refresher on uh, biohazards, but you know, it really wasn't a big concern. But these are conditions, these again, viruses that are absorbed and cause major bleeding issues. Um, most of these, as you can see, it's contact with body fluids, but most of it is like heavy contact with body fluid, like fecal matter and such like that. So unless you're living in extremely close proximity to these people, you're you're not going to get it. Or you know, you're cleaning up their vomit or their fecal matter or whatever. You're not going to be exposed to these subs to these viruses. Um, so. Yellow fever was spread through blood by mosquito bites for a while. Uh, we don't really see that much anymore, but um, that has that is a concern there. Uh, as you can see, the blistering, the bruising because of the um, not bl blistering, but the bruising because it causes blood clotting issues, and so the patient's blood vessels start leaking. I've read some really good um, explanations by virolo virologists suggesting that the plague of Europe in the that we called Black Death or the bubonic plague was actually not what we consider um, bubonic plague now and that it was very likely a or very possibly they weren't saying likely because it's almost impossible to, to determine that but the symptoms reported in the writings of the time are more consistent with the symptoms you find with things like Ebola in these viral hemorrhagic fevers versus the symptoms that we find with a patient who's been exp uh, exposed to um, the what we consider bubonic plague now. All right, so that's back viral bacterial. We we've heard a lot about bacteria, whether we're talking anthrax or MRSA, VRE, and there's so many other bacteria that can be activated by the five G signals in our phone. I mean, sorry, what? So a bacteria, unlike a virus, can actually exist for a very long time outside the body in a capsule or, I, w I don't want to say spore because spores are specifically for fungal, fungi, you know, molds and such, but in that vegetative dormant state where they are not going to um, grow or replicate or, or even be to start, they get this little capsule built around them um, until they find hospitable environments that will allow replication and you know that has adequate temperature moisture and food um and then they'll start uh replicating which is one of the concerns with related to uh foodborne pathogens is they they were everything was fine until it got to uh, exposed to oxygen or something and was allowed to multiply so anthrax you know you have the various forms Here's what we call bubonic plague or plague. Notice it's got uh, swollen lymph nodes and such like that. Um, one of the arguments for the idea that viral hemorrhagic fever is actually what swept through Europe was it was called Black Death because the patient's skin would turn black before they died. And hemorrhagic fevers cause that subcutaneous bleeding and bruising and really dark, intense bruises look black. And so that's one of the connections there. Um, whereas a lot of your primary symptoms from uh, bubonic plague are these um, swollen lymph nodes and things like that. Then there's the pneumonic version that's, you know, pneumonia, and respiratory, and such like that. All right, so neurotoxins, they can come from a number of different organisms. Here you can see man, plants and such like that. 
one of the more concerning ones are the ones that come from molds and bacteria. So we think of listeria and such like that, uh, food toxins that were uh, the result of uh, botulism is one. Now we use botulism for Botox, right? It's used as a medication because it paralyzes nerves, but when consumed through the GI tract in our food, it's extremely deadly. And unlike um, some bacterial food poisoning, it's the bacteria that causes the, the irritation or the, the infection. When it comes to bot, uh, neurotoxins like listeria and botulism, the bacteria produce the toxin, that's their byproduct. And then, so even if you've cooked the food, that toxin still exists in the food and wasn't destroyed by the heat. So neurotoxins will get you even, are, are existent because of poor food storage, not poor food preparation. And your respiratory can failure is your, the respiratory paralysis is your concern. So as long as you're maintaining their airway and breathing, the patients generally will do okay um, during it. Ricin is a neurotoxin caused by the cat, or made from the castor bean. You can synthesize it, you know, by, uh, or distill it out of castor beans. Very cheap um, effect, a uh, very easy method of doing that. Some argue that it is a um, very concerning chemical warfare or WMD hazard because of how easy it is to make. You know, we got some rednecks out here in Georgia that can figure out how to make meth from the hardware store. Pretty sure it wouldn't be hard for them to figure out how to make ricin from some castor beans. So there's your symptoms of ricin. Again, our focus is going to be supportive. We don't have a, a um, antagonist for these conditions. All right, so one of the definite issues that we have to deal with, and I'm pretty sure we all have our full fill of these people from the last two years, is the worried well. These are people who really, they're, they're healthy or they have very minor symptoms, but they're paranoid and, cons and convinced they have COVID. And so they want to go to the ER to find out if they got, and it's like, no, you're, you're fine. Okay, your O2 set's fine. You don't have a fever. You, you're, you're okay. All right, don't go to the hospital. And so... Unlike the news media and the TV and all that kind of stuff, we do want to do we want to do our best to keep the public calm, to reassure them that if they follow these certain recommendations or such, you know, keep your hands clean, take your vitamins, stay hydrated, don't go around people who are sick, you'll be okay. And your current vital signs and condition indicates you're okay, you don't need to go to the ER. So we need to kind of be that voice of reason in the community when something like this happens. The health department, your county health department and such like that is going to handle more of your symptom surveillance, uh, syndrome uh, surveillance, looking for like patterns of uh, increase of these types of complaints and such like that. Points of distribution are national stockpiles of medical equipment that will be released in the event of a incident or an outbreak of disease or something like that. Again, these were in the news quite a bit two years ago. Um, all right, so radiologic and nuclear devices. Um, the only time that an actual nuclear device was detonated was in Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, but during World War II. However, there have been several radiologic incidents since then. Three Mile Island up in Pennsylvania, um, Chernobyl, there was the uh, Fukushima 
nuclear um, disaster in 2009, I think it was. And then um, there's been other minor radiologic events uh, around the nation at various um, power plants and such. Most of the time, though, they're very localized, they're very contained, and there's not a lot of fallout or issue. The difference between these two is radiation. Radiation comes in three uh, forms. Alpha, beta, and gamma. All right, Alpha and beta are particles. They cling to dust. They'll fall out of the air, and that's where the term fallout comes from. Whereas gamma is a ray, and it's like an X-ray being emitted directly from the radioactive material, like a chunk of uranium or something like that, or plutonium. And as it decays, it breaks down. It gives off that radiation. So as long as the actual radioactive material, the plutonium, uranium, whatever it happens to be, is shielded and protected. It's not giving off the rays. But when you take that object and it becomes mixed in with an explosion or a fire, and so now those alpha and beta particles that are releasing are trapping or attaching themselves to dust or smoke or ash, then everything falling from that fire or from that area, that dust, could have radioactive material attached to it. So our radiation gear, you know, our um, radiation suits might protect us against those, the fallout particles, but washing on clothes, deconning stuff, just simply washing the dirt and dust off is really all you need to remove it. The rays, you know, like the gamma rays, like x-rays, those have to be, um, all you can do is protect by shielding. And so here's kind of an example of that. Um, we're not going to get into neutron radiation for the purposes of this class. It's not going to change how you approach this stuff. All right. Remember, the sun itself is emitting radiation. All right. Gamma rays, UV light, X rays, there is all coming off of the sun. So there's a small amount it existing already. And then there's a lot of other substances throughout the world or throughout the environment that are just naturally decaying and giving off radiation. So radiation is around us all the time. What we're talking about is material that is giving out higher quantities. So a dirty bomb, I think you you should probably be familiar with these already, but these are conventional explosives that have radioactive material mixed in with them. So it's disseminating those alpha and beta particles. It is not a nuclear explosion. You don't have that breaking of atom chain reaction that causes the massive release of energy like we've seen in all of the videos and history movies. All right, so nuclear energy, that's, you know, that's the actual radioactive material interacting with other um, substances and releasing the alpha or the gamma rays and such like that. If it's done very quickly, then you have nuclear weapons and a nuclear explosion. When it's done slow and controlled, then you have a nuclear reactor just creating heat. And that's how, uh, you know, a lot of military ships and some power plants are uh, generate heat in order to boil water and make electricity. All right, so um, when I mentioned intern or uh, alpha and beta particles because it can connect to dust and all that or be in water, if we drink contaminated water, we have internal contamination. If the dust gets on our skin, we have external contamination. And then the radioactive exposure would be to the waves themselves. All right, so here's some of the early symptoms. Um, unfortunately, though, if you are exposed to radioactive material and you start vomiting, you are pretty much while being exposed. Like if you start vomiting while in the presence of the material, you've pretty much got a lethal dose and it's just a matter of time. Um, so if you are having to respond to an incident, maybe where there was radioactive material and people have been exposed, the people who are already vomiting, you would triage them lower or you would triage them as expectant versus the people who are not yet vomiting because you can get them out of the scene, away from, and get treatment and possibly recover. But the folks that are already um, puking, well, they're probably not going to recover and so you don't spend energy on them if you have limited resources. What this does is causes a breakdown of cells by 
creating chain reactions within the molecules that the molecules start altering that will cause the cells to alter and then they don't function appropriately causing cell death or abnormal cell growth resulting in tissue failure um, and organ failure and then ultimately death. All right, so a radiation source. Because the patient was exposed to an x-ray, because they walked in front of uranium or plutonium or something like that, they are not radioactive. They are not re emitting gamma rays. They are not going to emit alpha and beta particles. They are not radioactive, all right? So you can then treat them without getting secondary contamination. Now, if they've been exposed to fallout the, from a burning environment or an explosive in, uh, condition where radioactive material was detonated, then you're concerned with con cross contamination secondary contamination and decon is near uh, is needed all right so how do we protect ourselves from anything radioactive and radiologic time distance and shielding limit the amount of time with exposure keep as far away from it as you can and have as much shield or block uh, protection between you and it so explosives I mean, they're explosives, right? They they go boom, right? Stuff falls down. Um, maybe they have a, a shrapnel built into them, or some other substance like a biologic or radioactive material, in order to spread that. So the explosion is just disseminating another um, uh, substance. Ammonium nitrate, that was what the Murrah Federal Building um, truck bomb was, the Oklahoma City truck bomb, was ammonium nitrate, which is basically fertilizer mixed with a, um, a fuel, I think it was racing fuel that it was mixed with, or maybe it was diesel, I can't remember, but it basically you mix it with a hydrocarbon and it becomes extremely volatile. Um, a couple of what was it last 2000 there was the large exp explosion in beirut lebanon at the uh, fire on the um <clears throat> in the port that was ammonium nitrate that was bulk ammonium nitrate that had been stored there for um except exceptionally large quantity stored there for way too long it had started to destabilize because it was so old when a fire broke out within the building fire got to it and it detonated like a bomb and that was you know where that extremely large uh, explosion came from I'm not really sure why this guy is wearing a mask um, it's kind of an odd I've always thought that that was a very odd picture you know like you know what's up with this um, copyright 2018 so it's older than that picture um, But anyway, all right, so that is terrorism and uh, terrorist events and responding to that. Like I said, there was a lot of crossover between that and our hazardous materials uh, chapter. So any questions on that? 